Coming up on this Jerusalem Dateline, a heartbreaking escalation of violence in the West Bank as three Israelis are killed in terror attacks and extremists rampage against Arabs in retaliation. Plus, U.S. congressional representatives meet with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and make plans to strengthen ties with Israel. And the Turkish church rises up in unity to help brothers and sisters rebuild after devastation and loss. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl. Palestinian terrorists killed an Israeli-American citizen in another deadly attack on Monday. Some are talking about a prolonged period of violence known as an intifada. Take a look. Palestinian terrorists shot and killed American citizen Ilan Ganelis on a main Israeli highway near the Palestinian Arab town of Jericho. The terrorists then shot at another car, set theirs on fire, and fled in another vehicle. A day earlier, a terrorist shot and killed two brothers, Hillel and Yagel Yaniv, as they sat in their car in the Arab town of Huwara, south of Nablus. We expect difficult days ahead of us. It may be here in Judea and Samaria, in the Jerusalem area, or in the Gaza region. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant visited the site on Monday and says he has given clear instructions to the Israeli security forces. Ensure readiness to face all threats, reinforce troops and activities on the ground, and most importantly, reach and apprehend the terrorists. After the brothers' murders, there's talk this recent violence could lead to a third intifada or uprising. The general big picture is one of, I'd say, at, at least three months of continuous terror attacks by different Palestinian organizations and responses and countermeasures by Israeli security forces. Former IDF spokesman Jonathan Conriquez says this could lead to what he called a rolling escalation. We're coming into the month of Ramadan, which historically speaking, even though it's a holy month for Muslims, historically speaking, it's a month of terror for Israelis. The attack in Hawara sparked unprecedented Israeli retaliation when hundreds of Israelis descended on the town to take revenge, clashing with Palestinians and setting houses, cars and a junkyard on fire. One Palestinian was reportedly killed. That resulted in widespread condemnation. I understand the hard feelings, but this isn't the way. We can't take the law into our own hands. Israel's government, the state of Israel, IDF, the security forces, they're the ones who need to crush our enemies. U.S. State Department spokesman Ned Price expressed U.S. concern about the weekend violence and Israeli rioting. It is imperative that Israel and the Palestinians work together to de-escalate tensions and to restore calm. Shai Golan, who heads a settlement council in Biblical Judea and Samaria, also known as the West Bank, condemned the rioting and said it's not the way of settlement leaders. To take the law into one's hands and burn things, this is not the way of Judaism, not the way of the Jews. There is a state and only the state will manage these events. The attack took place as Israeli and Palestinian Authority officials were holding a security summit in Aqaba, Jordan. Jordan called the meeting, which included U.S. and Egyptian officials, in a bid to calm rising tensions ahead of the Muslim fasting month of Ramadan three weeks from now. Meanwhile, thousands of mourners attended the funerals of the Yuniv brothers, who were buried side by side in Jerusalem's Mount Herzl Cemetery. Earlier, their mother, Esti, delivered a message to the young people of her community. God sends us grace. Even with this painful blow, he sends us grace. We have a huge hole in our heart. Nothing will ever fill this hole. Not construction, not protests, nothing. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. As Iran's nuclear potential reaches new levels and China increases its influence in the Middle East, the relationship between the U.S. and Israel grows even more vital. As Chris Mitchell reports, that's a major reason many U.S. lawmakers visit America's number one ally in the region. And afterwards, we'll talk with someone from the U.S. organization that makes these strategic trips possible. In one recent trip, four congressional representatives met with Israeli officials, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and the topic of a nuclear Iran was on the agenda. For me, I was the first Democrat that was against the JCPOA. I thought it was a terrible deal. It still concerns me. We're losing track of what the Iranians are doing 
And it was good to talk to the prime minister and to Ron to know that they haven't lost track. That's why they're seeking to get the U.S. back on track regarding Iran when they return home. I have a resolution out of Congress that says uh, Iran can in no way be allowed to get a, a nuclear weapon. And if they were to get even close because of the way that they're working on the nuclear fuel right now, that the United States stands ready, willing, and able to come to Israel's aid at a moment's notice and to protect them against any, any untoward military action by the, by the Iranians. Another agenda item, including preventing China from dominating the global pharmaceutical market. I've been a pharmacist for almost 37 years, and I understand how critical it is to have another source of what we call APIs, and that's active pharmaceutical ingredients. You know, it's no mistake that China cornered the market several years ago, and they control over 90% of the world's active pharmaceutical ingredients, and that's, that, that ought to worry people. Harsh Barger believes an FDA field office in Israel would be a good step. And I asked the prime minister, I said, why should we put it in Israel? And he said, it'd be the perfect place. You have all the biomedical, you know, advances and research and development right here in Israel. And, um, you know, it's, it, listen, the AI, the things that are going on in Israel, I don't know that the world really knows about it. And it'd be the perfect spot. One pleasant surprise for the U.S. lawmakers came in seeing Israelis and Palestinians in Judea and Samaria cooperating on a professional level. I'm a business, uh, I'm from the business world, and the cooperation between the uh, Palestine people and the Jewish people there is remarkable in developing uh, industry. And uh, we went to the industrial park there at Ariel. You know, those are things I love to see, economic growth, and also providing jobs for people, the opportunity, providing hope. Uh, they're on their own homes and uh, they're raising their children, educating their children, hoping their children will have a better life. The main priority, however, remains keeping the bond strong between Israel and the U.S. The overarching issue, of course, here is the American-Israeli relationship so that the United States has Israel's back and, quite frankly, Israel has the United States back too. Uh, that's probably the most important overarching uh, issue. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Joining me now is Joan Leslie McGill with the USIEA. Now, you've been involved in, in bringing these congressmen to Israel. Why do you do that? Yeah, it's a great question, Julie. So USIEA was founded in 2011 to bring members of Congress on advanced education tours to Israel. So we bring the senior leaders over here that are on the committees that are relevant to the U.S.-Israel collaboration, and we get to show them all of the education here on the ground for how they can continue to further that relationship. So what kind of response have you had from them? The members on this trip went home very excited and very encouraged about how they can practically move the needle forward on the U.S.-Israel relationship. They got to travel through the West Bank, which is something that is very unique to our trips with USIEA, and they get to meet with people on the ground, Israelis and Palestinians, business leaders, government leaders. They get to cross the gamut and really get that firsthand experience with people here in Israel. What are some of the key points now with U.S.-Israel collaboration? Yeah, so the members that were on this trip walked away with several new key points. I think one of those being how can we nearshore our U.S. pharmaceutical supply lines out of China. I think that is a major area of interest, bipartisan in Congress. And Israel and the Abraham Accords nations are a wonderful alternative for that. So the members really focused on that on this trip. And then also Iran. Everybody's concerned about the Iranian nuclear threat. There are obviously different policy positions on it. But I think the members got a clear vision of how they can move that forward as well. Wow, that's great. Thank you for joining us. Joan Leslie McGill with the USIEA. Thank you. Up next, a Turkish journalist tells us firsthand how Christians are helping their country rebuild after the country's deadly earthquakes. In the Turkish city of Antioch, where the followers of Jesus were first called Christians, our team met a group of journalists from a Christian network called TurkSat7. Host Senem Ekener shared what her team had found out after the earthquake. 
that while many church buildings were destroyed, the church continued its calling to reach out to those devastated by this catastrophe. Hi, we're here with uh, Sanem Akanash. We're actually in the city of Antioch where the Book of Acts says that uh, the followers of Jesus were first called Christians. Sanem, it's great to be with you. How can you communicate the, the depth of the disaster and the, and the heartache that people are going through right now? What we've been trying to do is the very reason that why you're here as well, that we want to document, we want to journal how the church is standing in the midst of such tragedy that is just so, how, so hard to describe and how people are coping, how are they now loving their neighbors, how are they supporting one another and the amazing unity among the believers in the country, both the um, traditional church congregations, Orthodox, Catholic and also the Protestant church community. Unbelievably beautiful um, unity among all the all the different denominations just coming together, standing together, touching each other's wounds, crying, and then helping at the same time. And how can people be praying and helping the church here in Turkey? Well, with ongoing support, it will be a long time ahead for the people uh, to have a life, uh, some sort of a life. Uh, so prayers and support is always appreciated and especially that God would move in their hearts and minds that they wouldn't grow cold towards him but see his loving hand in one form or another and encounter Jesus in, this, in the face of such suffering. And what kind of stories have you been hearing? What kind of miraculous stories have, have you been hearing? Uh, some children have communicated on social media. Of course, there's no first-hand uh, confirmations of those. But I did hear uh, with my own ears uh, from the social media that one little girl was describing there was this big man um, and he had a white horse. And of course, the father is asking her, and what was he doing? He was as tall as the buildings and he was holding the buildings with his hand. And some, after they were rescued, they were asked if they were hungry or thirsty. Mm -hmm. uh, one little girl told, no, there was, a, there was a sister with me who fed me and gave me water. Mm -hmm. And then they, she left when you came to rescue me. Final question, Sinem. We talked earlier about suffering, the mystery of suffering. How would you expound on that here, surrounded by all this devastation? It's been one of the uh, longest asked questions of our time. Where is God in the midst of suffering? How do we explain it? We have the best explanation, that is the cross of Christ before us. When we look at it, it's so mysterious. How would God turn such an event for the salvation of the humankind but he does that and he does that in your life and in my life on a daily basis so when we see such a devastation like this of course I will have unanswered questions I will pour my lament to him he won't give me all the answers that I would ask from him but he will give himself to me and then we see it in the Bible over and over again he gives us the book of lamentations and the Psalms of course well, Sinem, thanks so much for your helping us understand what's going on and chronicling what you do mm -hmm. for Turks at 7. God bless you. God bless you too. Thank you. Up next, marking one year since the war in Ukraine began, why military experts say peace may not be on the horizon anytime soon. Thank you for watching Jerusalem Dayline. We're committed to providing you with unbiased reporting from the Holy Land. Through weekly broadcasts, podcasts, and online media, our vision is to reach millions around the globe with the true story of what's happening in Israel and the Middle East, all from a biblical and prophetic perspective. This is a big vision and is only made possible by the generous support of people like you. Call us toll free at 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash Jerusalem Dateline and make a donation that will help spread the light of truth about Israel throughout the world. One year ago, the world watched in horror as Russian missiles pierced the sky over Ukraine, marking the beginning of a bloody war. 
Tens of thousands have died. Millions of Ukrainians are homeless, and much of the country lies in ruins. So what are the chances of peace coming anytime soon? Gary Lane brings us this look at the first year of the war in Ukraine and what may come in the days ahead. Emboldened by his 2014 takeover of Crimea, Vladimir Putin believed he could quickly take eastern portions of the country and Kyiv the capital. Putin saw a response creating the opposite outcome from the one he desired. NATO and the European Union say they are now united, stronger and more determined to defend their democracies. So too is Ukraine. Adrian Kubicki is counsel general for the Polish government in New York. He predicts tougher times with a new chapter in the war. Uh, obviously for Putin, uh, this is something uh, also about saving face uh, after one year of, uh, let's, let's put it this way, unsuccessful invasion of Ukraine. He must finally make some progress, which means that um, it will be very harsh for Ukrainians. The war has already proven costly to the Ukrainians. Much of the country lies in ruins. Bombed out power stations, businesses and homes have left many without electricity, food and water. Eight million Ukrainians have fled to neighboring countries and more than five million are internally displaced. And the Ukrainian government reports as many as 40,000 civilians and 10,000 troops have died in the conflict. Russia says it has lost 6,000 troops in the war. Mark Moyer is a military historian. We've got to be careful about drawing any conclusions about who's stronger here and recognize that it'll, it could be decades from now that we know the full truth about both sides. At least one truth is clear. War with Russia has made Ukraine more determined to join the European Union and NATO. And some European nations are concerned about Russia's intentions beyond Ukraine. NATO may soon have two new members, Sweden and Finland. Those countries stayed neutral during the Cold War, but this renewed Russian aggression moved them into the NATO camp. Poland is sending Ukraine German-made Leopard tanks, and Joe Biden is pledging to send them American-made Abrams tanks. Might the aggressive arming of Ukraine escalate the conflict and ignite World War III? We know right now that uh, Putin and uh, Russia military is not capable to invade NATO countries, any other countries, uh, their struggle in Ukraine. Uh, so we're pretty sure that the measures we're taking are appropriate. Despite the billions of dollars in help, Kubicki admits the war is unlikely to end anytime soon due to Putin's determination to win no matter the cost. Yeah, since they were not able to gain this major victory within a couple of weeks, they will go for years just to kind of exhaust our patience and exhaust uh, the, re the resources that we allow ourselves to spend on Ukraine. And this, in that scenario, pessimistic scenario, would mean uh, uh, ultimately uh, Russia's victory. What happens next mostly depends on domestic pressures on Vladimir Putin. The Ukrainians say a Russia late winter offensive is already underway, yet they're determined to fight on, not only to win the war, but to win the peace and control their destiny, free from Russian control and influence. Gary Lane, CBN News. Coming up, a U.S. Marine goes on a daring mission to rescue his Afghan interpreter from the Taliban. A United States Marine and former mixed martial arts champion risked his life to save his Afghan interpreter after the country fell into the hands of the Taliban. But he says God didn't want the mission to stop there. Take a look at Mark Martin's story. When Marine veteran Chad Robichaud learned about the Biden administration's plan to pull the U.S. military out of Afghanistan, he thought it would be a disaster. So a full withdrawal and a surrender of Bagram Air Force Base, I knew it would be catastrophic for national security, for global security, and stability in the region. And it's just not consistent with how we deal with post-war uh, conversions in, in, as, as America. Having served eight deployments in Afghanistan, Robichaud on, tells CBN News his first thoughts centered on innocent people stuck in a country led by a brutal regime. Additionally, my biggest concern was our allies, those who fought beside us for 20 years being left behind. One being my friend Aziz, who did uh, 15 years in special operations, eight deployments with me, saved my life multiple times and, uh, and just my, my friend. I was really worried about my children because my relatives, they turned their back at me 
my friends, my you know parents, <clears throat> everyone, they're like, you're not coming to our house. This is your call. You did it. Now you handle it. And I cannot go to relatives. I cannot go to friends. And it was a total chaos. It was, it was for me, it was like the end of the world. 14 years after Robichaud's final Middle East deployment, he organized a rescue mission to save Aziz, his wife, and six children. Once in Afghanistan, the situation on the ground led to change. One of our team members noticed this group of 3,500 orphans and said, hey, uh, let's not just get Aziz's family, let's get these orphans as well. Uh, and we kind of paused for a second. All of us are Christians. Uh, we all felt the burden that God put in our hearts to just help as many Americans, interpreters, their families women, children, Christians that be persecuted. We just want to help as many people as we could. The goal became a mission to save thousands from Taliban rule. Altogether, Robichaud and his coalition of heroes evacuated more than 17,000 people. When the military was forced to leave after that Abigail was blown up and 13 hour service members were killed, uh, we chose to stay uh, because we knew the White, White House was standing was 100 Americans. We knew there were thousands of Americans, thousands of allies. We knew we still had the ability to help, so we did. Robichaud shares his story in a new book titled Saving Aziz. He gives readers a behind-the-scenes look at what happened after the chaotic withdrawal of the U.S. military, describing the miraculous evacuation efforts during Afghanistan's historic humanitarian crisis. The book's important to us, not, as, not to sell books, but it's important that the story gets out. And the man whose name is in the title also sends his own personal message. To please keep uh, the Afghan uh, poor people in your prayers, because I strongly believe in prayers. And uh, even with this evacuation thing, uh, I prayed in the name of Jesus and he answered. And, you know, it all happened as a miracle for me. He kept us safe. Uh, he gave us clear thinking and, and opened doorways that were impossible for any man to open. And we were able to do this incredible thing and just be part of it. Uh, you know, but ultimately, God orchestrated it, and all glory to him. Mark Martin, CBN News. That's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can also access CBN content through our CBN News apps. I'm Julie Stahl. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.